So biophilia is a term uh, popularized by uh, E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson, a, a biologist and entomologist at Harvard, and he believed, and I think that the evidence is pretty compelling, that as a species we've co-evolved with nature, the larger nature, and so to be fully happy and, and productive um, human beings, uh, I would argue we need, to, we need to have that contact with the natural world. So I'm, I'm an urban planner by training, and, and we're constantly thinking about how we design and build uh, cities, cities and ur urban environments. And even today in my field, there's this sense that to promote the compactness and the density that we want in cities to make them sustainable um, means that they probably are not going to have a lot of nature in them. And I, I think that's wrong, and that's not really true that we can have the urban and, and the nature together. In fact, we have to, as we increasingly become an urbanized planet and we increasingly recognize that uh, access to nature, contact with nature, is not optional. It's something that we absolutely need that, that's essential to human health and, and well-being. We've got to be creative. We've got to find ways of having the, the urban and the nature um, together. This neighborhood is a relatively dense suburban environment where the homes are close together and compact relatively. The, the denser city is and, and within walking distance. So this is not a bad example and it does show that you can have uh, the green and the, the walkability all together and, and again layered here on, on, on top of this is this amazing uh, creativity that this is a, a neighborhood that almost sees itself as a, as a palette. The creation of art is not something that you just, just done by artists that display in galleries. Rather, the whole neighborhood is, is a kind of palette. So the, every little space, every wall, every side yard, uh, every garden is an opportunity to express oneself in an artistic way. been describing this neighborhood as a right brain neighborhood and that that the natural the contact with nature the feeling of oneness with environment um, happens in that same part of the brain where uh, we're, where we're creative and and I think that creativity is enhanced and fostered and and um, stimulated by contact with the natural world and it may actually work the other way as well we see a lot of the creative expressions that people the things that people draw and and paint and and make are often things in nature, the birds and trees and, and so on. So there's a, an interplay there. We don't fully, perhaps don't fully understand it from a scientific perspective yet, but to a biophilic neighborhood is also a creative neighborhood. And so we need, we need to pay attention to that and we need to create environments that on the one hand ref, reflect that, find expression for that, but help to reinforce it as well. So in many, many ways I would say that South Rio is a great example of a right brain neighborhood. We're going to be facing lots of challenges in the future. Peak oil, long-term decline in global oil, for instance, uh, all the impacts associated with cli climate change. Uh, w there are lots of shocks, potential shocks, that, that uh, people will have to face. And resilience, the, the, the more resilient, the more creative people are, and the, more, the greater the reservoir of creativity in a family, in a neighborhood, in a city, the better able uh, they will be to respond, adapt, and, and, be res and, and the more resilient they will be in the face of these calamities and future pressures. So the green, um, if my theory holds, the green elements, the biophilic elements of a neighborhood and a city will help to en enhance resilience. One of the qualities of a, of a community um, that will make it more resilient is, is, is that it is a community, that people know each other, they care about each other, they're connected to each other, the social capital of that place is, is high, or is great. And we know actually the evidence is already there that when we create green environments, people um, affiliate, associate with each other. They tend to be outside. They tend to, to want to get to know each other. Um, so the green will actually have a social um, implication, helps to build uh, friendships and, and connect people to each other and, and, build, and build a sense of caring. And those things will all help. Uh, help us to be more resilient. Many of the green elements in a, in a neighborhood or in a city 
uh, could directly help us become more resilient. So for example, the edible uh, landscaping, the, the, the having the, the potential to grow food in your neighborhood, in your city. So food production in a, in a neighborhood is itself a green feature, um, but also helps us to become more resilient. There are clear results, clear, clear kind of uh, outcomes from having the qualities of this kind of neighborhood. We, we, we feel better, um, we look around us and we, we see, we know actually from a biophysical point of view that these kinds of natural environments have a calming effect. Our heart rate goes down, our blood pressure goes down. Um, we know that uh, when, we, when we design uh, health environments with these kinds of green uh, features that patients re recuperate more quickly, they uh, recover more quickly, they need fewer medications and that sort of thing. There's definitely a healing power. So in a sense, this kind of a neighborhood, which has green all around it in every spot, is, is very much a healing neighborhood. So there are, there are really important health and well-being implications of designing places like this. Just as I've had this great experience of walking around and seeing things and noticing things and being exposed to all this, this creativity and all, all of this greenness, uh, kids are affected by that uh, as well. We sometimes talk now about this idea of free-range kids or designing environments for free-range free or feral kids. Uh, the notion that you kids ought to be able to, to have the freedom to walk out the front door and be able to, to get from one place to another uh, without having to get in a car, to find places, things to do, interesting things to do, and, and natural environments, trees to climb, places to play. And South Fremail is definitely a place that has those, those qualities. We have lots of very sterile examples of living environments, not only in my country, but just a few kilometers away here in Perth. Probably the vast majority of this larger metropolitan area consists of sprawling uh, suburban or exurban developments that have those that turf grass lawn and and that accommodate the car and that uh, are not particularly pedestrian and may or may not be very green. So this is a this is a distinctive, unique neighborhood compared to almost anywhere. I would say um, we have other examples in other cities and other parts of the world, but this is a really really good one for all of these reasons: the the walkability, the the green and biophilic. Uh, elements and this and this um, creativity that seems Im imbued or embedded in everything here, and the, the the fine details, the ways in which people have embellished uh, their their environments, from from doing things on the sidewalk to to what they put on the outside of their homes, to all the in some cases really wild and crazy things that they do. Uh, so there are a number of really interesting things about this neighborhood that make it very unique. There's a strong sense of place here. That's what we need in neighborhoods. We need that, that, um, those, those, that variety and that diversity in, in the, in the uh, quality of the environment. I love the Australian raven, which has this, this almost um, baby-like sound, this ah, 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 and you hear it, and, and frequently you'll be walking along and one or two, a pair will be, will be perched on a rooftop and watching you go by, very, very intelligent um, creatures. And I, I imagine they're talking to me, but they're probably not. <laughs>